Coming up on this episode, New York Times bestselling author Lauren Blakely joins us to talk about her brand new book, The Best Men. Welcome to episode 357 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Jeff, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Will. Hey there, Rainbow Romance readers. We are so glad that you could join us for another episode of the show. I'm so excited for this extended interview we've got with Lauren Blakely. Will and I became big fans at the end of last year. Will read The Bromance Zone, which he reviewed in episode 351, and then I read The Best Men, Lauren's co-write with Serena Bowen, and I reviewed that just a couple of weeks back in episode 355. And I have to tell you before we get to this interview that I recently read the prequel to The Best Men, which Lauren and Serena dropped at the beginning of this month. Super Hot Wingman is a perfect sort of prologue setup to The Best Men. In this short story, we're introduced to Mark and Asher, and we see what led up to the drunk text incident that has to be dealt with at the beginning of The Best Men. We get to see when Mark was first introduced to Asher, and how Mark formed his less-than-great opinion of his soon-to-be brother-in-law and his frustrating but super hot best friend. Just like The Best Men, Super Hot Wingman is a lot of fun, and it's such a great insight into these characters, particularly Mark. And it shows you exactly how Mark and Asher became the enemies that they are. Super Hot Wingman is available for free wherever you get ebooks, and there's even a free audio available on YouTube, which is narrated by Teddy Hamilton and Jacob Morgan, the same incredible duo who voiced the full book. Now let's get all the details from Lauren about The Best Men, a super sexy, fun romance. Lauren shares how she and Serena decided to co-write, how they came up with Mark and Asher, and all the different things the couple goes through to end up at their HEA. We also talk about how she went from being a journalist to a romance author, plus she's got some great book recommendations and a preview of what she's working on for later this year. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. It is so amazing to have you here. Thank you so much, Jeff. It is a pleasure to be here. I am so excited to get to talk about this book with you because it actually finished my reading for 2021 to get to read The Best Men, which you've co-written with Serena Bowen. It comes out this week. Tell everybody what this book's about. So The Best Men is about two best men at a wedding who aren't exactly friends and who might have had a very awkward group drunk text interaction because one of the guys, Mark, group drunk texted a bunch of people and said a lot of things about the other best man in Asher. So it's a little bit awkward. And that's kind of what sets the stage for these guys who have to work together to do some planning and prep for a wedding that they are both the the best men for. And they do that in sunny, hot Miami, where lots of things get hot, tempers and bodies. I have to say that between Mark and Asher, I just as a way to start the book, starting to play with who these characters are, reading the blurb, ignoring the fact that it's very clear who sent the drunk text, you would assume it would be Asher because of like the person that he is. And yet it's Mark, who's much more the button down banker, Wall Street guy, sending the drunk text. So immediately you're already playing with the idea of who these guys are. Exactly. That was, it was, and I will actually say that was Serena's idea for how to start the book. It was like, what if this kind of Wall Street banker type winds up sending these drunk texts? I'm like, oh, yes. And he's mortified. And that was the key. Like we wanted to start the book on Mark's mortification. Like here is this guy who is at this point in his life where things are starting to change for him because he's recently divorced from a woman, but he knows that he's bisexual and things are just starting to change in his life. But then he does this thing that he ordinarily wouldn't do. And he has to figure out what on earth am I supposed to do to deal with this mess that I made. And it was a mess with the best of intentions because he was just trying to look out for his sister. I felt really bad for him at the same time. It's like, dude, drunk texting, but... You're trying to be a good guy at the same time, sort of. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And Asher really had a field day when he read those texts from Mark. He is such... They're both really good at the banter, but Asher just knows how to make those little dings. (laughs) 
Asher was really a delight to write. I mean, well, they both were because I do think they're so different. I think Mark has this great dry sense of humor and Asher is so good at sort of poking and prodding in just like the most delicious way that kind of like a slightly cocky hot guy can do. And I think that's what makes them such a brilliant team because once they find their rhythm, because aside from all the romance they've got to figure out how to do and find the time for that, they've got to put this wedding together and that's not an insignificant task. Three days on the ground in Miami before everybody shows up to make sure it all happens right. And we really wanted to be able to have each of them bring something to the table, if you will, during the different aspects of the wedding planning process, whether it's you know getting the cake or getting the flowers or the DJ or whatever it is. Like they each have their expertises and they can help each other, even if they don't really realize at the time that they're actually helping each other and complimenting each other because it takes them a long time, well, mostly the whole book, of course, to actually realize that they are these puzzle pieces that fit together, but that their their different personality traits wind up being, you know, exactly what the other one actually needs to be complete. Exactly. And it's, I mean, it, it boils it down to like the basics, but like... I, I feel like oftentimes Mark is like the bad cop because he's very much the, I have my to-do list and you, the vendor, are going to do these things with what you agreed to. And then Asher kind of slides in as the good cop going, but it's okay because this is going to happen and everything's great. We'll pay you maybe a little more, <laughs> you know, whatever that is. <laughs> and Mark likes being the bad cop. And I think sometimes, and, that, and he, does, yeah. he does, like that's part of his personality. Like he's got that sort of like, dry edged him like he's a little bit of a hard ass but I mean he's a trader on Wall Street so it makes sense he has to have like this certain tenacity to go through the interactions that he has in life but of course I think and hope over the course of the story he learns when to let go of that side and to you know let people in from time to time and to decide okay I don't have to go to battle on every single thing I like and I it. think that's some of the journey that we wanted to take him on. It's like, okay, what do you need to fight for? And what do you need to say? Okay, I will take your help on that. And I love how it's difficult for him at the beginning, especially to be like, okay, I'm going to let this go. <laughs> it's very hard for him. <laughs> how did you and Serena create Mark and Asher? First, I'll tell you how, how the story came together and that I... You know, Serena had the idea for the drunk text. I had the idea for the title. And I said to Serena, would you, do you want to write a book together called The Best Man? This is, could be a fun little concept. And then like, and the way we created it instantly just kind of typified how we did everything throughout the writing process. Because as soon as I said that, you know, we got on the phone, I was out walking my dogs, we're having this conversation about this potential story. And she's like, yeah, and it could start with a drunk text. And it's like, each idea, like we just build on the other one. And that's what we did. So we had a couple of brainstorming sessions and plotting sessions before we actually wrote the book in the summer of 2021, where we had like our Google Docs and you know, like the shape of the plot and these character traits and their outlines. And like each time we would talk about the book and build it, you know, we would color in a little bit more of each of these guys. Like, what are they like? What are their issues? What are their wounds? And I think that really helped because we both wrote both men in terms of what we did each day, in terms of the writing assignments, if you will. Like it wasn't that she wrote Mark and I wrote Asher or anything like that. It was just, what does the story need? What are the next two scenes? You take that one, I take that one. Sometimes we would leapfrog and I would write the next scene after what she was working on. And then we would fill in the document at the end of the day. We're like, oh, okay, cool. We'll just stitch these together. That really works. But I think it was because we were constantly just building on the ideas that we both had to create this universe and to create these characters. And I hope that that it comes across that way <laughs> as people read it. I think it very much does because it's it's one cohesive book that it, you can't really tell, well, somebody must have written this versus somebody had to have written that. It's like one thing written by a single mind in this case it was just two minds <laughs> fused together through the google docs you know we definitely had a bit of a unimind thing going on <laughs> I know. there was definitely a, a lot of that and what happened too is if 
I would write a scene that didn't quite land, or if she wrote something that was imperfect on the first draft, we would really get in and help the other one and figure out like, okay, wait, this is what needs to be here. You know, let's see if we can uh, tackle this a different way. And I think in so doing, we were like constantly passing the words and the characters back and forth and like really taking care of them and frankly of each other as co-writers so that we did have this really unified creation. I even remember sort of the first extended joke is early in the book when they're at the bar at the engagement party for Mark's sister and Asher's best friend, that's the couple that's getting married. And Mark explains these differing levels of hotness to Asher. He's trying to like kind of tap dance his way out of, you know, the embarrassment he feels over the text that he sent where he said, this is in the blurb, that Asher was super hot. And Mark has this extended, you know, like soliloquy on different levels of hotness. And I remember like, I took a first stab at it and I was like, fix this, Serena. And she's like, okay, okay. And then she would go in and like adjust it. And, and at the end, I remember saying to her like, oh my God, this it's like, I felt like we were in the writer's room on a TV show, like working a joke together. That's totally how it felt. Cause I was like, this joke isn't there yet. Like, let's really make it shine. And we did together. And I'm, I'm really proud <laughs> of that extended bit, but it was something that I don't think would have come just from me or just from her. Like we really had to fine tune that together. And I think that's what we did in many places throughout the story. Like you just really get in and it's not just blending voices, it's blending ideas. And I think you can make something that I, I hope is even richer than it would have been otherwise. In terms of working together that way, you mentioned how you might leapfrog scenes just because of like word assignments and everything, who's taking what in the moment. Did you get all the way through a first draft and then come back and start picking it apart again? Or were you working like day to day inside your scenes and then figuring out how to stitch together as you kind of moved along? I think we're both kind of mostly rolling revisers where we like everything that we've worked on that day to be in pretty decent shape. Sometimes there would be like an idea, like maybe we'll make this one adjustment about Mark's ex-wife. And we sort of knew like that's something we could just sort of easily weave through when we get to the end. But in terms of where the, the two heroes were at in each scene as we took them through that, I think for both of us to move on to the next one, we had to feel like the prior scenes were done, at least from... Uh, a character point of view. So it was really only like little details. Like there's this something about this person's job we have to work on in, you know, when we do our revisions. So yeah, we really made sure like each day or the morning after that, that we were happy with where we were before we would move on to the next thing. She's ahead of me by three hours, which so is on the East coast. Like I would wake up like, okay, this is, you know, this is what I'm thinking of tackling. These are things we need to do. Or I would leave her notes at the end of my night. Okay. This is what I finished. These are the scenes on the list for tomorrow <laughs> or, we would throw it out and be like, we need new scenes. <laughs> I think this needs to happen sooner. I think we need to get to the dance club on Tuesday night instead of Wednesday night. There must have been quite a timeline document somewhere, I would imagine, because you had <laughs> three days before somebody showed mm -hmm. up and then the wedding day, and then you already had this idea that they had to depart the wedding venue. <laughs> <laughs> And yep. so much had to happen in those three days to kind of set them up well. Yeah, there was really a lot. We definitely, yeah, there, there are some, which is, I think, partly why we um, demarcate it. Okay, it's Tuesday, it's Wednesday, it's Thursday. Because I just think that's helpful when you have these compressed timelines. It's so fun. I love writing stories that can take place over the course of a week, for instance, even though there's, you know, sort of more after the wedding. But that wedding itself, it's, it's so important when you're dealing with a forced proximity trope which is what we had here to play with is just really making sure okay we need to hit all of these different things in this day so yeah we had like lists of wedding errands like okay are we gonna do this one are we gonna do that one throw that one out bring this one in what do we need where would be a funny place to like make a dirty joke or oh how about the cvs errand yeah let's add this in this will be great the CBS <laughs> yeah, awesome. that was fun <laughs> <laughs> That was a blast. I really enjoyed that scene. <laughs> and I really like what you did with Force Proximity here because it's a very different take than normal because they're at this mansion with a guest house. We get really early, like, they're not staying in the mansion because that's the wedding party and the families, and so they're going to stay in the guest house. But even while they're alone here, they Force Proximity themselves in the guest house. <laughs> 
know, I keep just smushing them and smushing them together. Okay, I have a very Serena story to tell you. So before we started writing, I remember she sent me an email with lists of Miami properties. She's like, okay, these are the different mansions. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I'm like, I love you. This is so cool. <laughs> she picked the property. She's like, and this is what it would cost to rent it for a week. What do you think? I'm like, perfect. It's just you absolutely. Planned the wedding, basically. It's absolutely, yeah, we really did. It was really perfect. She even had the tent. She's like, and this could be the tent that they use. <laughs> so yes, that was great. Were you with her on that? <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that aspect of research. No, I hadn't. Because so much of it, you could just make it up. And like. <laughs> I was really impressed. <laughs> That's awesome. So I really have to know to the degree that you can tell me who came up with the spreadsheet being cast <laughs> into such an integral role. <laughs> I actually discussed this with her before I came on the podcast. You know, I mean, we, we both feel, I think, the same way in general about a co-writer. So at the end, even we don't remember who wrote most of the different scenes, which I think is sort of the hallmark of a good co-write, but I'm 100% comfortable saying the spreadsheet was her idea. She is such a spreadsheet person. I once actually showed her this spreadsheet I have for my book files. It's so messy. And she's like, oh my God, that's hideous. You know, she was like, <laughs> like Kramer on Seinfeld, like, don't look at me, I'm hideous. Yes, I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> she's very much a spreadsheet person. I was like, you can keep lists on spreadsheets. Okay, cool. Let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, the spreadsheet was, was her idea and it was just such a blast working with that and you know being able to have that framework for the jokes I mean that's something that I really enjoy is sort of looking for great opportunities to to find like just the right joke in each scene it's like okay where what, what's it going to be what's the punchline what's the payoff is this like a quick joke is it a long con joke what's it going to be and I think the spreadsheet the spreadsheet is sort of like it's not a long con joke, but it's like a joke that can extend throughout the entirety <laughs> of the story. So I was so glad she had that idea because I really, I really love what, <laughs> what it became. It, it is sort of like a living, breathing, like dirty joke inside the book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it really, I mean, I love a good spreadsheet too. I would have never <laughs> considered a spreadsheet for some of the uses they had for it. <laughs> no idea <laughs> but the jokes just lended so well you know because i already like spreadsheets <laughs> you've co-written with three other authors previously amongst your hundred something books that you've got out in the world what brought you to co-writing with serena I love Serena. She is my favorite author, which is something I've said publicly in many places. Like I just, I, it's, it's an id thing. Like I just really connect with her writing. I've read most of her hockey books. I've read most of her MM books. She has it, you know, she just has that magic that really, really speaks to me. Him was probably the first book of hers that I read. Everybody knows that of course. And then I, I've read many of her MF titles as well. I read Rumi and just fell in love with that and listened to it in audio as well. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was at an audio awards event in Los Angeles and I was with a couple of narrators and I was with um, this woman who heads up the oral fixation audio group. And we were all getting dressed and doing our hair and makeup. They all were fans of Serena too. And I was just like, I'm going to tell them like my great wish. I was like, you know what, ladies, I think I really want to co-write something with Serena Bowen someday. And it was like, I had said it, you know, it'd been sort of like this dream that I had had and I wanted to voice it and like put it out there in the universe, if you will. I'm like, you should, you should. And I kind of sat with it for a while. I think that was like late 2019. And then finally I mentioned it to her and she was open and we started talking and then COVID, blah, 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 blah. Everything is derailed, yada, yada, yada. And then we revisited it at the end of last year. She was my dream co-writer, to be quite honest. She really was. And I was just super excited. <laughs> and she wanted to write with me. <laughs> like, oh my God. When she would write each day and she would say, I just dropped in a scene in the talk. I was like, ah, I, I had to stop myself from fangirling, which of course I did. I like would fangirl all of because this is so good. Oh my God, this is so funny. I also edited her hard and she edited me hard, <laughs> but it was That's important really, co-writers. it was really just such a treat. And I have say, I learned so much as a writer too. And I've written close to a hundred books and Serena is a master at tension. She is so good at keeping the tension in the story. And I felt that she really contributed that ability of her significantly to our co-write 
with sort of gentle reminders, not in a teachery type of way towards me, but like, you know, I can sometimes be a little more wanting characters to confess their feelings. And she'd be like, let's hold it back another chapter. I'm like, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. And then that was something that I really took away after our co-write. And I think I've been able to apply it to more of uh, my solo books that I've written since then. So it was just like a wonderful experience just on a day in and day out level, a wonderful experience because we're both really proud of the finished product. But I also think like I learned new skills as a writer too. So yeah, I'm very lucky. <laughs> That's awesome when that can happen, not only to get the story, but to just tweak the craft a little bit too. Yeah, just keep learning, like new skills. I mean, we all need that. How did your process mesh with hers as you kind of came together to like do the work of the plotting and the writing and all of that? I think we were actually surprisingly similar. We both um, mostly plot, but we don't overplot. It's like, we don't know that there's going to be 30 chapters or 30 scenes or anything like that, but we both really try to look at our stories with sort of like a, you know, three act story structure, the three act arc. I mean, we would look at um, like, what are the emotional wounds and how do they, you know, how are they going to be solved and how do they each fulfill each other's emotional wounds? How did they become complete ultimately in a relationship? So we sort of knew like the, the, the broad emotional goals. We knew what some of the twists and turns were going to be in the plot. But we both are really open to the story changing. We'd had a couple different, I don't want to say twists necessarily, but just different potential directions for what would happen to Mark and Asher after the wedding. But when we were getting there, we were both like, well, that's not quite going to work. What if we did this instead? And we sort of plotted, you know, one weekend while she was going away during the summer and she was getting ready to get on a flight. Like I was, you know, in bed at 5.30 in the morning, bad habits, like texting her on the phone, which I don't do anymore. I wait till I get out of bed. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's an aside. <laughs> but we were talking about sort of like this new direction that we wanted to go for the final arc of the story. And I think that's what you ultimately want with a co-writer, somebody who just sort of recognizes like the living, breathing, organic nature of a story and responds to what is happening on the page. I think I would later go on and tease her about it in our various writer groups. We're like, no, no, it's good. Like, I'm glad that we, that you especially are open to like things changing at the last minute when we were working on the last sequence there, you know, there were things where like we were messaging each other, like the last two days we were writing the book, like what if this, and I'm obviously being deliberately cagey because I don't want to give away the ending, but like, what if this happened instead and we did this thing? And then we're like, yeah, all right, that's the way to go. So I think it really meshed because there were directions, but there was also like a mutual receptivity to ideas and to shifts and to listening to the characters. Yeah, that's the thing I really liked about the final act of the book, because I had in my head, of course, how they were going to resolve after the wedding. And then even before they left the venue, I'm like, oh, hmm. what now? You know, and you, you, you ratcheted that tension up to where, I mean, I knew at the end they had to be together because it's a romance. Yeah. But it's like, oh, how are they going to fix that problem? <laughs> Yeah, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I like it when I get tense like that in a romance about, yeah. you know, I know it's going to be fine, but how? <laughs> right, exactly. And that's how I felt when I would read what she wrote each day. I would get that sort of like giddy but tense excitement over what was happening in the story. That's exciting as a writer, too, to be like, what's happening? And then get it to go from there. It's like. It really is. It, it, it definitely was very much a writing cave. Like we felt like it, it felt like we were just in the Mark and Asher world every single day. Like I wasn't, you know, doing much of anything else. And I wasn't writing anything else. I had actually thought I might be able to write another book at the same time, but there was no way. Like as soon as we started this, I'm like, nope, they are demanding everything. We are giving everything to the story. There's no way my brain could be any place else. But in this, and I think it was just that tight focus and showing up every single day. And we wrote it in five weeks. Wow. <laughs> because we were both writing every day. So we had a great workout every day. We're like, look at our workout. That's awesome. Does that include the revisions or just the first draft? I mean, aside from like sending it away to editors uh, who might come back and work I, on it. Yeah, so. I think that was the first draft. And then I think probably our revisions 
took us about four or five days, but it wasn't as intensive. It wasn't like we were doing it eight hours a day or anything like that. You know, the revisions were like, you know, two or three hours each, probably a day over the course of a week, I think. That's, oh. That's it was so really cool. intense. <laughs> it was intense, intense, and yet it sounds like fun too. It was. It was absolutely. How much would you say Mark and Asher changed over time, as you got in and got to know the characters, and you know how they behaved and where their snark was and where their pain points were? I think that he, at the beginning, you know, you have this goal, and you're thinking, okay, opposites attract. So you're kind of dealing with, you know, just these general and specific character traits at the same time. But you really don't know until you start writing that scene. Like, how are they interacting with each other? Like, what are Mark's soft spots that we don't know about? Like, what are Asher's pain points that we don't know about? So I think we probably knew like 65% of each of them, maybe. But then as you go, like each scene reveals another level. And you're like, well, I didn't know that about Mark. I didn't know who his friends were. I didn't really know what his relationship was like, you know, with his coworker and, you know, same for Asher. And then just learning with, like, in his case, how does he interact with these different people? And what does that reveal about him? Just even how does he interact with the flight attendant? Like all of those things just show you another layer of the person and then of course how they interact with each other and respond to each other especially in awkward uncomfortable situations in dressing rooms or planes or <laughs> clubs <laughs> pools <laughs> cars okay i'm not gonna get anything away the way i usually ask co-writers about favorite scenes is like what's a favorite scene of yours and what's a favorite scene that serena did but given that so much of this <laughs> is really joint efforts here I'll let you answer the question how you want. You can separate it or you can do one scene that just is a favorite. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, Serena said that I could say that I wrote most of the dance club scene because that was an idea that I had that was very clear in my head when we were plotting it. I was like, I can't please be a dance club scene. And I was like, I love nightclub scenes. But like, how guys dancing together? Oh my God. Like, yes, those are so awesome. Like, please put it in every book. <laughs> so she's like, you're doing that scene. <laughs> and she had a very clear idea of how to sort of take the lead on, without giving too much away, on the scene when Asher goes into Mark's room and he sees him watching a particular show that they watch in the story. So she kind of took the lead on that. And it's just, it's so sharp. And I just, I loved it. And I was so excited when I saw it. I'm like, oh my God, yes. That's like exactly what we talked about and imagined. I think she felt a similar way. Like we both contributed a massage, those scenes. But yeah, I was, I was really happy. I think we were both really happy with how both of those scenes turned out. So that's my one little reveal about kind of who took the lead on which one. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Do you think we might get more of Mark and Asher at some point somehow? I, you know, I don't know. We loved writing together. I think we both would love to at some point in the future. But I think we're also quite similar in that we both like having a certain amount of um, freedom as we look down like the, you know, the tunnel of the next year and the next few years in each of our respective schedules. I'm like, okay, these are the books that I'm planning. These are the books that she's planning. Maybe in a few months, maybe in a year, maybe in a couple of years, like, okay, let's do it again. Like, I think we're both totally open to it, but we don't have anything scheduled and we don't have anything planned yet because we're both trying to just leave ourselves space in each of our own schedules to just kind of like write like I like being able to write what I want to write and when we have that next great idea I think that's when we'll come back together again like wait I'll wake up some morning she'll wake up some morning we're like this is what we're gonna do and maybe it'll be in 2022 and maybe it'll be in 2023 who knows I think probably you know there's a good chance at some point <laughs> my Fingers sort crossed. of vague answer exactly Let's talk about your kind of beginnings as a writer. What really kind of got you started down the path of becoming the author who's now, as, as we talked about, has almost 100 books out? 
it's so strange to think that I do. I guess I have a lot of voices in my head and they're noisy and they demand to come out. <laughs> and I just like being busy. I, like many writers, I uh, was a journalist for a long time. That was sort of my first career when I, you know, shortly after college, I dabbled in some various writing things and then kind of found my way into business journalism, covering TV and media and marketing, which is why... TV, I, anyone who's read a lot of my books will sort of see these intersecting themes. I have a lot of characters who have TV shows or are TV producers or an entertainment business. So I think just like that exposure that I had throughout my journalistic career to the entertainment business helped inform some of my stories. But I did that for, I think, 15, 16, 17 years. And, you know, journalism imploded and started to change. And necessity is the mother of invention. And I remember in, I must have been 2011 or 2012, a brilliant friend of mine named Teresa, who knew that I had wanted to write, had said, maybe this is the time for you to finally consider self-publishing. I was like, oh my gosh, should I? Should I finally do it? Uh, because I had been pursuing traditional publishing in a different genre. And I thought, okay, maybe she's right. And I'd had some romance books at the time. They were, it was sort of back when chiclet was more of a thing. Like that's kind of what, like in, in the early 2000s, there was this resurgence, you know, that was obviously like Bridget Jones and Emily Giffen. So I, so I started as, I, I don't know if your listeners know this, but I started in MF, which is why I'm kind of taking you, taking you back to like my MF side. Um, and that's, that's sort of where I started. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And I did, I rolled the dice and I told myself if my first self-published book hit a particular milestone in terms of sales and numbers and revenue that I would write another one and it happened. And then the next one did. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, you know, there are lots of exciting possibilities here. I just kept doing that and kept writing. And while I was writing, that's when I started occasionally reading MM. And I was like, oh, this is sort of interesting. Like, I kind of like this. This is, you know, a different sort of experience for me. Like it hits me on a different sort of visceral level as a reader. So I always had it in the back of my mind to try writing gay romance. So you've been in it now almost 10 years if I did the quick math right. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what the spreadsheet says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I published my very first um, title in January 2013. So yeah. Wow. Nine years. Oh my God. Nine years coming right <laughs> up here. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. What eventually drew you into writing romance? Because you mentioned that what you were shopping to the trad publishers was a different genre. I love romance. I just really do. I The books that I was always drawn to when I was growing up, I you know I was drawn to Danielle Steele, to Sydney Sheldon, <laughs> Jackie Collins. I ate that up. Like as soon as I found those books, I was like, oh my gosh, they were just, they, they really, really spoke to me and resonated with me. And then when Chiclet had its resurgence, they were sort of like, oh my God, this is for me. Like, this is what I've been wanting to read all along. Like I want to be hit in that chest with flutters and swoons. I want to feel that. Like when I go to the movies, I want, you know, I want that kiss. I want that feeling like, like that I get in my body as a spectator watching the movie when you have that first screen kiss. Like I just love that. And that's, I sort of knew that was ultimately the genre that I most wanted to write. So it was kind of a perfect fit once I started writing romance. I'm like, oh yeah, this is me. Like, this is totally what I want to do with all of these voices in my head and like the energy that I feel in my body and like in my heart and in my chest when I'm writing, like I love that and respond to it. And it's a joy to write that and to sort of experience with characters, like falling in love all over again, a hundred times <laughs> or so. <laughs> I love junkie, romance junkie. <laughs> you just get that HEA over and over and over and over again. <laughs> it's so good. Well, that's the thing about the best men too. You kind of reference, you know, like rom-coms and movies and your history in like covering entertainment. I could completely see the best men being a Hallmark movie. Toned down a little bit for what Hallmark is. <laughs> yeah. yes, know, it's boy. a little hotter than a Hallmark. But... <laughs> We've seen the movies about the two thrown together because they got to plan the wedding. And... Exactly. <laughs> Maybe a Netflix Listen movie to job, so it please. can be hotter. <laughs> yeah, so we can have a little sexy kiss. You know, yes. some shirtlessness, please. <laughs> <laughs>
And then you're still writing some MF too, right? Are you kind of going back and forth between doing MF and MM now? Yeah, I'm definitely doing both. I have a, a strong readership in MF uh, because I probably wrote, I think, about 80 or 85 MF titles before I published my first MM title, which was A Guy Walks Into My Bar, and that came out in August of 2020. And I'm so grateful that so many of my MF readers and listeners wanted to try it. I really, uh, I wasn't sure if they would move. So like it was known, if somebody followed me on social media closely, they would know that I read MM because I would you know, tweet and talk about on Facebook and Twitter about different MMs that I had read over the years, you know, Kindle Alexander, Lucy Lennox, Serena, and Rachel Reed, various titles. Like I would chat them up because I, you know, I love these titles and really responded to them. But I, I just wasn't sure if that meant enough of them would follow for it to be something that I would be able to keep writing. And I'm, you know, very fortunate in that it happened. And a guy walks into my bar, you know, had good reviews and a good reception. And I was like, oh, okay. There are enough of you <laughs> that actually want this from me. So I'll write another one. Yay! <laughs> and yeah, now I've written, I think I've published six MM titles since then. And I believe the best man will be the seventh, I think. The length of novels, I think. Yes, yes. Seven, yeah, I've published six. MM novels and Best Men is my seventh and one MM novella and many more to come. I know some authors will write both, but split their pen names. What led you to keep Lauren Blakely as the name all the romance is under? You know, my marketing mindset is often that uh, unless you're writing in an, ex an incredibly different genre, that it makes the most sense to keep the same name. Before I did MM, I dabbled in some very, very sexy MF and MFM romances. And I deliberately put them out still under the Lauren Blakely name because I was like, you know, readers are readers. I'm, I am a reader of various <laughs> genres. I read MM, I read MFM, I read MF. I do tend to like the high heat books. But because of that, I was like, I kind of am comfortable consuming it all as a reader. So I didn't want to potentially splinter or split the audience because I knew that there were, are enough in that Venn diagram, if you will, who are going to cross over. So yeah, it just, it sort of made enough sense that like at that point in my career, I don't want to build a new name and I had enough of a base as Lauren Blakely. And also I had been writing more gay supporting characters into my books and started hearing that readers were interested in them getting their own stories. And now there really is like a lot of cross-pollination, if you will. Like a lot of times if I am setting up a hero to eventually get his own gay romance, he will appear in the MF books so that those people who read MF will get to know him. Like Grant in my Men of Summer series, people met him in the other baseball books. And we're like, I can't wait for grants. They're reading about Crosby and Nadia. And then they're reading about, you know, Holden and Reese. And like, okay, I know I want Grant and Declan's story. So I like that sort of crossover because one, I think it's what the readers are connecting with, but it's also hopefully what the real world, <laughs> you know, to some degree can be like. Mm -hmm. How interconnected is your universe? I'm just curious, because there are some <laughs> authors who essentially you know, even series to series will put, essentially everybody lives in one big happy world. Is that the same for you or are there really kind of some delineations in there somewhere where we may see people just cross up into other books? No, I, yeah, I would say it's sort of one big world now and there's definitely a lot of uh, crossover and there's sort of this running joke. I have this coffee shop called Dr. Insomnia's Coffee and Tea Emporium. Um, and it appears wherever I name. want <laughs> it goes, it goes wherever I want it to go. Jeff. <laughs> like sometimes it's you know in the village in New York, sometimes it's in Chelsea, sometimes it's in Gramercy Park, Upper West Side, Brooklyn, sometimes it's in San Francisco, sometimes it's in Los Angeles. It's really wherever I want it to be. So it's kind of become like this Easter egg amongst my, you know, like hardcore fans. Like, okay, I saw Dr. Insomnia's coffee shop here so yeah i like to just bring different characters from my world into whatever i'm working on and sometimes they're like okay if i'm working on a story and somebody needs an agent well i've written you know book agents and tv agents and entertainment lawyers so take this person and he or she will appear in the story that's awesome so you worked in the previous genre before is there another genre currently that you would love to go 
noodle around in, whether it's a subgenre of romance or something else completely, or is it you want to just keep creating happily ever afters, which of course is a beautiful place to be as well. <laughs> I think I will probably stay in romance. I don't have uh, a strong pull to write a thriller or to write young adult or anything like that. I really love love stories, but I, you know, I, I'm definitely interested in different types of love stories. I had dabbled, like I said, in some MFM stories in the past, and that's, you know, a lot of fun to write sometimes just from the choreography point of view. Uh, so I, sometimes I think it would be fun to play with the number of people falling in love and other people involved in a story but mostly I'm really pretty happy kind of jumping back and forth like mf mm mf mm and for now hopefully that's what I can keep doing what would you say the trademarks of a Lauren Blakely story are heat heart humor and dogs cute dogs <laughs> heat heart humor and a bit with the dog <laughs> I think I'm really known for writing good guys. That's sort of where I, I started to, to make my mark is I know that a, there are many, many books and many writers who are successful with writing sort of like a great asshole hero. And that's not something that I'm very good at. So I think it's, as a writer, you want to know, like, what are, what are your, what are your true talents? And can you lean into that? So I think I've sort of learned like, yeah, I mean, I can maybe write a guy who's got a little bit of an edge, you know, I can write a guy who might be cocky, but I think ultimately what I write are these guys who are confident, good guys, you know, with like a little bit of charm, a little bit of an edge, but ultimately, yeah, they're, you know, they're good guys and you know, hopefully humor and heat. And I think, especially in the sexy scenes, I really try to bring that heart and that emotional connection to it. And I really try to ask myself with every sex scene uh, and to make sure like, this is not just about the choreography. This is uh, this, what, what is this scene about? This scene is about intimacy. This scene is about trust. The scene is about forgiveness. You know, this is about exploration. So it's not just body parts. So, you know, I think and hope that that's part of what makes the sexy scenes in my books fun and enjoyable to read or listen to. It was certainly something that I noticed with Mark and Asher. And of course, this was a co-written creation of characters, but they are nice guys. They're very different in how they're nice. And I really like that they were both really equals. Sometimes you get, you know, in those cases where you've got, you know, in Asher's case, he's the former jock and he's kind of like this professional photographer and he's got that swagger going for him that it would immediately put someone who is more of the numbers geek in more of a su submissive mm -hmm. position. And, and Mark's having none of that. There are two equal alphas who both know when to give it up <laughs> a little bit, depending on the scenario. And I really loved that dynamic. Yeah, and I think it was fun, especially because it's an enemies lo to lovers romance that they have that sort of friction. Okay, like how can they scrape against each other and, you know, bring out the good and the bad and work their way through the good? I'm glad you responded to that because that was definitely something that was important to us that we wanted to create that dynamic. And it was a dynamic that we didn't necessarily plot, but that the characters sort of demanded. So we would go with it. We're like, okay, who's doing what in this scene? I'm like, okay, okay. Because it wasn't always obvious because it can be sort of uh, a trade-off, which is typified by how they first respond to the car that they rent. Like that mm -hmm. scene, I think really typifies their dynamic probably forever and ever. <laughs> Yeah. 20 years down the road, right? we're going to come back to the car exactly. in Miami. Which is why they work. <laughs> you know, it just is. What's a book you've read recently that you would recommend to our listeners to pick up? Oh, well, I have to say, I really did love Only One Bed by Kara Andrews that you recommended. I devour that after I listened to uh, your review on the show. So I'm super excited for her for her next book. One of the books that I have read in the past year that I'm really excited about is Unwritten Rules by Katie Casey. She's a debut author. And I sort of met her over Twitter because she was writing gay baseball romance as well. She sent me an arc and I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. It was just, it was so, the writing is beautiful and dreamy and sort of poetic and it hurts at times. And the characters are rich and deep 
and complicated and it's sexy. And as soon as I finished it, I was like, oh my God, it's the best debut I've read in years. I need to blurb this book and we should write something together as well. So I, but I am, I recommended her before I asked her to co-write with me because I've been in love with her book so much. I was like, oh my God, we have to write something together. So yeah, I think everyone should check out Unwritten Roles by Katie Casey. It's really, really wonderful. And I think most of your listeners know Rachel Reed, huge, huge, huge fan of Rachel Reed. I'm like dying for her next book. <laughs> you and me both I can't right. wait to see what's going to happen there. <laughs> oh, I've read all of her books and she's so good. Yeah, she's just amazing. I love a good hockey book. Mm-hmm. And she does them so well. Yeah, she really does. How amazing with a debut author, you pick it up and go, I want to write with you because this book is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She was like, "Really? You really like?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's do a short story. Let's do a little scene for our newsletters." That was the goal. We were gonna do like a 2,000 word cro- baseball crossover scene, like one of her characters, one of my characters. I was just gonna be something we put out in our newsletters. And you know, 20,000 words later, we had a novella that we released called "Dirty Slide" uh, about two rival baseball players um, and their relationship. And we're gonna do another one, a "Dirty Steel," that will come out probably in the fall of 2022 yeah she was great to co-write with it was very organic as well like we could really sort of trade off and the great thing about writing a baseball romance with katie casey is like i know enough about baseball to be dangerous and she knows enough about baseball to be incredibly precise so i was like this is so awesome i don't have to double check any of my baseball facts i'd be like fix this line so use whatever whatever you want to call it when they're like leading off third base or whatever and i'm like i don't have to think about it because you will because you are the baseball person here so that's brilliant you had serena to figure out the wedding venue when you have katie to figure out the baseball exactly i'll just tell the pet jokes you know <laughs> Well, but I will say anytime there is in one of my books or co-written book, an insult about the Boston Red Sox, that's all me 100% can't stand the Boston Red Sox. So that goes into almost every book of mine. Wow. Okay. Some deep seated (laughs) things going on there. Exactly. I'll be in therapy for that, I'm sure. So you mentioned the Katie Casey co-write that's going to come out in the fall of 22. What else can you tell us about what's coming this year? So I am currently working on an MM duet. It's called the Hopelessly Bromantic Duet. Book one is Hopelessly Bromantic and book two is Here Comes My Man. And it's a romance between a writer and an actor. Uh, The writer is a romance writer. So it's just, oh my God, it was going to be one book, Jeff. And once I got in and started telling, I was like, oh my gosh, this dude has been living rent free in my head for years. You know, (laughs) I can't write one book about a romance writer. Okay. (laughs) So yeah, they're getting two books and it's a lot of fun and it's hard and it's emotional and I feel like I'm just really like intensely living in this world between this American romance writer and this British actor and sort of like this cross continent romance they're roommates to lovers and you know then they become enemies and then they have to be fake boyfriends and so it just they kind of go through a number of tropes and scenarios across wow. across the two books i i think and hope a lot of emotional ups and downs and really taking them through like a, what i hope is sort of a, a great emotional arc where they're learning a lot about themselves and each other duologies are cool i like it when a romance can go over more than one book because there's so much story rather than trying to just you know jam it in to one yeah and that was kind of how i felt about these guys like when i really understood what their backstory was and how they first met i thought wow yeah they are definitely going to need like an entire book one that gives you you know how they met and what that first sort of taste of young love was like and then what went amiss and you know what potentially brings them back together and then you know what turns them into enemies (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then back into love. <laughs> so I have to ask before we wrap up, because this is my theater geek coming out. I saw in your bio that you like show tunes. So I have to know what some of your favorites are. Anything by Patti LuPone. Ooh. I am such a Patti LuPone fan. Like she's my favorite. If I could meet any actor it would probably be her but i would just be like a blubbering mess if i met her in person I'd be like oh my god patty i love you i've loved you since i was 10 oh my god i love her i listened to her memoir in audio she's such a diva 
And I love that about her. Like in her memoir, she tells the story of how she destroyed the dressing room when she got the news about Sunset Boulevard and how Glenn Close was going to like get the role of, of um, the, the lead in Sunset Boulevard on Broadway. And she like smashed things in her dressing room. I'm like, oh my God, this is why you're Patty Lupone. So I would say like anything that she does, whether it's her anything goes, I love her version of company, uh, of being alive and company. But I also, one of my ultimate top show tunes ever is Being Alive from Company, sung by Raul Esparza. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous version of that song. So those are some of my show tunes picks. That meets all of my theater geek needs. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) So how can people keep up with you online to know all the good stuff coming in 22 and beyond? I am pretty chatty on Twitter. And what is my Twitter handle? I'm pretty sure it's Lauren Blakely. Um, yeah, so definitely I, I talk back to people. I at reply on Twitter. So that's a good place to talk to me. I'm also on Facebook, but you know, I don't know of like what my friend's limit is. But if anybody wants to chat with me, definitely Twitter is a good place. And of course, laurenblakely.com is, has my newsletter sign up and info on all my books and what's coming and all that good stuff and Instagram as well. Fantastic. Well, we'll link to all of those places in the show notes and all the books that we talked about. Thank you so much for being here and and best of luck as the best men releases that you and Suna have the most successful release possible. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. It was really a treat. I've enjoyed your show so much. So I fangirled a little bit too when he was invited (laughs) on. So thank you. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the conversation for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And don't forget, the show notes page also has links to everything that we've talked about in this episode. And thanks again to Lauren for talking to us about The Best Men. I really can't say enough good things about this book. Make sure you pick it up as it comes out this week. And I'm super looking forward to the duet duology that she mentioned. Romance writer plus actor? Yes, please. Bring it on. (laughs) Definitely looking forward to that one. All right, I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next in episode 358, we begin a brand new monthly feature where we'll be looking back and recapping episodes of the classic sexy supernatural series, Dante's Cove. I had such a good time revisiting these episodes and getting to talk about them with you. I'm looking forward to sharing this with everybody. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening. And we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kind of stories that we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Production assistance by Tyson Greenan. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. 